we talked about unemployment. There is one other warning that I want to discuss with the people of Mississippi today. There is another danger that is coming into clear focus in this moment. Isolation and loneliness were the plague of our time before we ever heard of COVID-19. Diseases of despair, opioid addiction, and suicide were ravaging our country long before we had ever heard of the coronavirus. In 2018, a national survey showed that loneliness had reached an all-time high in the United States. Nearly half of U.S. adults reported that they sometimes or always feel alone. Forty percent felt isolated without meaningful connections. A study by Brigham Young University said that a lack of social connection is as dangerous to your health as 15 cigarettes a day or alcoholism. We have seen the consequences to prove it. The CDC says we've seen a surge in suicide by working age Americans, up 40 percent. We are in unique times, but the old threats remain. Right now, there are a lot of Mississippians out of work. There are a lot of Mississippians that are afraid for their health. That means real stress and often despair. We need to rally around one another in these times. In this time of social distancing, there will be some who feel it more than others. There will be many who won't have group chats or families to grill with. They need our proactive love and they need our proactive attention. Mississippians are a tough, proud group. We don't always like to admit it when we need help. If you can reach out to a friend or colleague, someone that you haven't talked to maybe in a day or a week or a month, maybe even longer, it might make their day. It might just make a difference in their lives. In fact, it might make the difference. If you can treat people with kindness, you can help in this fight. If you can look out for your neighbors who may be desperate for food, supplies, or even just a little human warmth, I know that it will make a difference. I've been inspired by the stories of Mississippians doing just that. Mississippi is a generous state that knows how to weather the storm. Don't forget to take care of yourself. You can protect your health by following CDC guidelines, washing your hands, staying home, wearing a mask when you have to go out. You can also protect your mental health. Do something active. Get out in nature. Read a book instead of watching cable TV. Spend some time in the Word of God or spend some time in prayer. Help someone else. That's one of the most rewarding things you can do is help your neighbor. For a lot of people, this might seem like common sense or a waste of time. But I'm worried about all the Mississippians out there that are alone right now. And I want them to know that we need them too. We need you to be strong. We need you to be smart. We need you to step up in this dangerous time and look out for your community. You may be at home, but you are not truly alone. There are three million Mississippians in this fight with you. You are important to me, and you are important to many others. I'm counting on you to get through this so we can come out the other side stronger, having saved Mississippi lives along the way. Today, I want to announce a new resource for Mississippians who want to step up and help fight this disease. MEMA is launching a new website, a Business Emergency Operations Center. This is a portal where Mississippi businesses can put their hand up and offer their resources to those in need. We've already seen so many step up. Individuals 
and small businesses alike, stepping up to produce masks, to produce hand sanitizer, and even to help us convert ventilators. In other emergencies, we've seen businesses quickly able to provide insulin or water, whatever is needed in the area, to help us get through. This doesn't automatically make you a vendor. It's just stepping forward so that we might be able to identify a helper when the need comes. And the need is coming. It is imminent. The website is msbeoc.org. Let me say that again. M is in Mississippi, S as in state, B as in business, E as, em as in emergency, O as in operations, C as in center, msbeoc.org. At this time, I want to turn it over to Director Michelle to offer a few more details about this particular website and the th things that he is doing to help us. Thank you, Governor. As the governor indicated, we give you the website at msbeoc.org. It's a virtual business emergency operations center. Uh, in the case of the COVID response, much of the resources that we've had to acquire have been through the private sector outside of the national stockpile with federal resourcing. What this is going to give uh, businesses an opportunity to do is to go on. You'll click on the link where it says register. You'll go in and enter the company's information. It'll also give you the opportunity to talk specifically about what your business, the services that you offer, the products that you offer. Once that is done, uh, the information is entered. Uh, an email will be sent to my communications director. You'll be entered into a basically into a um, into a database. And in the event we have a disaster such as this, we'll go in, can pull you up by the product offerings, or send you an email and ask you if you have specific product offerings here. As the governor has mentioned, there's no uh, there's no price to do there's no cost to join this, uh, and it does not qualify you as a vendor of a state. But we do have a, uh, a website link there that if you want to be a certified vendor for the state of Mississippi, you can do that as well. Thank you, Director Michelle. And just as a reminder to all of the people across Mississippi, today we are here to talk about COVID-19. But April is often the most challenging weather month of the year throughout our state. In addition to that, we are going to be dealing with floods uh, in the Mississippi Delta and other places. Uh, as we did last year. And in addition to that, before we know it, it will be hurricane season. Uh, and the early indications are that the Gulf of Mexico is warmer than we would like for it to be. And therefore, it could be a very challenging hurricane season in 2020. And so uh, we, we've got a lot to prepare for uh, in addition to COVID-19. At this time, I've asked Dr. Byers uh, to give us an update from the health department's perspective on where they see us on COVID-19. Thank you, Governor. Um, as the governor mentioned, we had an additional 177 cases reported um, yesterday with an additional eight deaths. You know, that's putting us close to 2,000 cases in Mississippi now and 59 deaths, and every death that we have is tragic. Um, this is a point in time where we all need to remember those things that we can do to protect those individuals who are most vulnerable. If you look at our deaths, uh, most of those deaths are occurring in individuals who are 60 and over. Um, we already know that this is a vulnerable population. Uh, we've seen uh, impact in this age group before with other infectious diseases, including things like West Nile and influenza. So, the more that we are able to protect ourselves from infection, uh, the more we're able to protect those individuals within the population who are vulnerable. Uh, we've also seen some data that indicates, and as we look at our data, and it's important to remember, the more cases that we get, the more data we have to be able to determine who is most impacted by this ongoing outbreak. We have seen some racial disparities in the number of cases and some racial disparities in our deaths as well. Right now, we're looking at about 50%, maybe a little bit more of uh, cases occurring in African Americans. We're also seeing uh, more than 50% of the deaths occurring in African Americans. This is troubling, obviously. 
we are also seeing that in those deaths, there's a higher rate of underlying um, chronic medical problems. Um, this is not surprising. We knew that those individuals who were most impacted uh, and have a higher risk of, of death and complications are those individuals with chronic underlying problems, the individuals who are elderly in our population. Um, you know, when we think about some of the things that we need to do as Mississippians, one of the things I want to remind individuals is if you do get tested, if you have, a, if your physician has enough of a suspicion for you to be tested for COVID, that's the time that you need to start isolating. Um, don't wait for the test results. If you're tested, what our recommendation is, is to begin that home isolation at that point. And we have some instructions that we're giving out to any individual who's tested at one of our um, uh, testing clinics that we're having throughout the state. And that is to go ahead and start isolating at that point. Wait for your results. Don't uh, go and run a bunch of errands if you're sick. And even if your test is negative, please stay home until you're symptom free for at least 48 hours because you may have something else that can be transmitted to other, other individuals as well. So we're at a critical time. We are not at our peak yet. Um, we need to continue to stay the course. Um, we're gonna continue to do vigorous investigation around each case, vigorous um, contact investigation, and make sure that we continue to protect those folks uh, who are most vulnerable from getting infection. Thank you, Dr. Byers. As you, uh, as you know, uh, it is critically important that every Mississippian step up in these times. Uh, it is critically important that you do everything you can to take care of yourself because if you take care of yourself, if you self-isolate, if you adhere to the shelter-in-place order, if you only go uh, to your essential business operations or if you are an essential employee, uh, if you only go to work um, and you do so responsibly, uh, we are going to continue to see uh, a flattening of this curve, uh, limiting the, the total number of cases, which ultimately will hopefully mitigate and minimize all unnecessary deaths uh, from this. Every single death uh, is uh, tragic, and we want to mitigate and minimize those if at all possible. Stay home, stay safe, take care of yourself, and take care of your neighbors. So with that, I'll open the floor to questions, and we'll start to my right here with Scott. Governor, are you worried about people, for lack of a better description, becoming stir crazy, having been cooped up and trying to stay in so long, now feeling they have to get out for lack of any other explanation? I'm very concerned about that. It is, uh, as we have had conversations over many weeks now, uh, when we talked about uh, the shelter in place order, uh, the health department, um, Dr. Dobbs, Dr. Byers, um, all of the experts uh, have said, and I completely agree, that we can only do a shelter in place order for so long. Uh, you cannot, it, it just won't work if it's weeks and weeks and months and months on end. It's the reason that we made the decision as we were going into uh, what we believe would potentially be the peak resource allocation time, for, time period, which originally we were thinking probably was April 21 or 22, which is now being estimated to be April 17, 18, 19, somewhere in that range. Uh, and we don't know exactly when it's going to be, but we know it's going to be soon. Um, it's the reason that we have issued the, sh uh, the shelter-in-place order. It's, it's, it is concerning, though. Uh, you, you probably heard me say last week that in the week prior in the state of Tennessee, there had been more deaths from suicide than there had been from COVID-19 in that one-week period. Now, that's uh, not necessarily true anymore, but that is something that is real. Uh, people are uh, struggling. They're struggling, you know, the, the way I described it earlier today is this, people who have the virus are scared of what the impact's going to be to them. People who don't have the virus are scared that they're going to get it. And a lot of other people, tens of thousands of them are scared because they're now out of work because non-essential businesses have been shut down. And so they're scared and wondering where their next meal's gonna come from. 
I am very concerned about that. I know that these are challenging times, but I also know that if we can stick together and if we as a state, no matter where we come from, no matter our geographic uh, diversity, no matter our political affiliation, if we can stick together for the next several weeks and, and, and flatten our curve, lessen the impact on our health care system, then we can come out of this and we can be better and stronger on the other end. It's just we're at a critical time right now and one that we must all work together to come out of. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Byers, you, you mentioned the racial disparity. I know that we had asked on a few occasions about that, and now knowing that 50 or more cases were African American, more than 50%, you said, right. of the deaths were African American. Is there anything, or is it too early to know, is there anything that can change resource wise, perhaps in places like the Delta, um, where we know that folks are at a higher risk because of the demographic? Well, certainly testing needs to occur, and, and we'll have those discussions to make sure that we have testing available. We need to be able to identify those cases. We need to be able to um, get those cases isolated, get their contacts quarantined, and protect those individuals who are at highest risk. Um, you know, we know that there can be higher rates of underlying chronic medical problems among African Americans in Mississippi. Um, this is not news. We, we've seen this before. Um, and we know with COVID-19 that it can have a disproportionate impact on those individuals with underlying chronic medical problems. We just need to be aware, and we're gonna be placing that information on our website. Do we know how many of those people who have died did not have insurance? No, that's not data that we have at this point. Is that something you'd be looking, because I'm seeing there may be a correlation between those uh, people not having access to right. I get where you're going to uh, the late, to lead up to these deaths. So it may not be something that MDHS, uh, the health department is looking, but is that something that may be on your radar, Governor, as you look to uh, face the health care challenges beyond COVID-19 here in Mississippi? Yeah, well, there, there's no question uh, that there are a lot of different uh, reasons uh, that the um, number of cases as well as um, the death rates are higher amongst our African-American population. Number one, as was mentioned earlier, the uh, underlying health conditions. Um, we talk, we've talked repeatedly uh, about the, um, the role that things like uh, diabetes and obesity and other uh, chronic health care issues play. Uh, we also have to continue to redouble our efforts uh, to communicate with um, individuals uh, across our state. Uh, we're, we're trying to work hard. We are encouraging um, uh, leaders uh, in the African-American community, but, but leaders across our state uh, to also step up and communicate uh, to, to either, if you're an elected leader, to your constituents, if you're a pastor, uh, to your parishioners. Uh, let's communicate and talk about the dangers that exist out there. And there are, there are dangers to anyone uh, that has uh, chronic medical conditions. Yesterday, I mentioned uh, in our call with the vice president, he was very clear the federal act that passed, uh, the federal government is going to pay for um, uh, COVID-19 related expenses for anyone who is uninsured. Um, many, many, many private health insurers for those who have private health insurance have waived copays uh, for those that are affected by COVID-19. And so what I would say to the people of Mississippi is do not allow um, the financial challenges uh, that were either pre-existing before COVID-19 or that are now a challenge because of the economic disaster that is before us. Do not allow that uh, to keep you from going and seeking help and see seeking testing at our test sites, which we have moved uh, around the state. We're going to continue to focus. Uh, I believe we were in Moss Point yesterday. If I'm not mistaken, Moss Point is an uh, area of our state where we've certainly seen uh, a high number of cases, uh, particularly within the African American community in that particular um, city. And so we are trying to push resources uh, to uh, those communities where we're seeing clusters and outbreaks. And Moss Point is a fine example of that. Yes, sir. I hate to, I, I guess I want to clear this up for what's going around social media right now. 
and this perception that there's a possibility you could catch COVID-19 from your pets. There was a story about some tigers that caught COVID-19, and so some people I've seen on social media saying or worry that people have the perception that you could get this from your pet. Could you address that? I, I certainly can, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> we don't have any, any, any data or indication that individuals can become infected from their pets. Now, we know that some animals, and, and obviously it's been demonstrated that, that certain cats can become infected. And so our recommendation for individuals who are infected with COVID-19 is to allow other family members to take care of that pet or to, to have some distancing from that pet if you're the primary caregiver. Uh, we don't want those pets in, infected, but we don't have any data that indicates that there can be transmission from your pets. Dr. Byers. Yes, sir. Uh, recently, uh, MSDA started reporting uh, the amount of private lab testing that's being done, and that seems to be the higher proportion of numbers. Can I ask you, is that the number of samples collected for testing or the number of completed test results? Those are the number of individuals that we have a completed test result for. I'm receiving reports from uh, providers that what they're being asked from the actual, uh, on the clinic level, is how many samples are collected. Is it then complete, is that information coming from the private lab specifically? Quest right. Our, our information comes directly from those commercial labs through electronic lab reporting. Quick follow-up. Uh, are we collecting racial demographic data on who is being tested? We do have that data. We don't have it published yet, but that's certainly something that we're going to be looking at. I mean, as you can imagine, we're getting a whole lot of data collected right now, and it's going to take some time to look through that data. Going back to the insurance question, certainly, you know, we have multiple data sources where we'll be able to t tell, especially from hospitalized patients who's been insured, who hasn't been insured, or what their payer source is. So we have many different data sources that we're going to be looking at over time. And real quick last yes, question. sir. Um, because the, the question is being asked at the clinical level, how many samples are being collected? Is that data available so we can see maybe the footprint of the testing to come? And th that data that we get on labs is reported directly from the laboratories that are performing the tests. I'm being told the clinics are, are being asked for data and then sending it directly to MSDH. Let me get back to you on that right, one. Thank you. Do we know how many have been tested so far now? Is there, are there new numbers? Uh, we're currently getting that data to update those numbers, but it's going to be over the number that we had yesterday, which was almost 21,000. Jeff, so just as a reminder, um, as it relates to testing, um, it is now required uh, by the federal government that all testing uh, is reported to the CDC. Obviously, in this entire process, uh, decisions that are based on data are much better than decisions that are based on emotion. And the best way to make the best decisions based upon the best data uh, is to have the best data available. That's the reason that the bill that the President signed uh, on last Friday night requires the aggregation of that data. Um, and so because of that, uh, the, the private labs, uh, and we have offered, and, and I commend the Department of Health, if, if the private labs report to the Department of Health, the Department of Health then reports it to the CDC as is required, and the private labs have met uh, their federal requirements because we aggregate it uh, and send it to them. But that's critically important. We were over 21,000 uh, tests in Mississippi yesterday. Um, that put us uh, at a, somewhere between 135 to 145, 150 percent uh, of the national average in terms of the fact that we had tested approximately um, 7,000 per 1 million residents. Um, testing has been uh, an area, and by the way, that's without significant federal resources on testing. You know, when you look at uh, the, the large number of tests that have been done in places like New York and New Jersey and even in the city of New Orleans, in lar a big reason for that is that the federal government has really directed many of their testing uh, resources to those areas where those clusters exist. Um, I've got to commend uh, the Mississippi State Department of Health uh, but also uh, UMC and the University of Southern Mississippi and everyone that has pitched in, uh, our, testing, uh, <clears throat> our testing has actually uh, been a shining light uh, in Mississippi when compared to many other states around the country, all of whom, by the way, are working diligently to do more tests, and we are as well.
Jefferson Joe. Davis County has a high percentage of African American population. They don't have any cases reported at this point. But has there been testing done there? And if not, is there plans to do testing there? Certainly, we can look at that. So, mm. do you know now if there has been testing there? Or? I don't know that there's been a testing clinic that we've conducted there, but we can look at, at, at um, uh, putting that on the list, absolutely. Is there any more time frame on when those additional hospital beds could be put to use at Shelby and the uh, procurement of beds in North Mississippi? So, as I said yesterday, our goal is to have those beds uh, ready and able to take patients whenever they are needed. Um, that is the time frame. Uh, we, we have teams uh, that are doing um, engineering assessments and other items. Um, I was told originally uh, that that um, entire process could happen within seven to eight days, and I advise them that sooner than that is when it's going to happen, and I trust that they're going to make that happen. Uh, but again, uh, remember, the, the, we are look, the, the way we are planning for this and our surge plan that I described yesterday assumes the scenario from the IHME data dated April 1. Now, they significantly reduced their projections in the last 48 hours, but we utilize our own internal data, but we looked at the April 1 data from that particular model, and we looked at it, said this is what our needs are, and then we added 50% more onto it. So we're, so uh, I, I can't tell you with certainty that we're gonna need those 400 additional beds. In fact, I'm, I'm not sure that we are. What I'm telling you is our job is to plan for the worst and pray for the best and expect somewhere in between. And so that's why we're, we're putting those uh, resources online. And I'll let Director Michelle, if you wanna speak to, you may have a more updated information than I as we have not talked about that this today. Well, Governor, I just would reiterate uh, what, what you said is that absolutely we want to have those beds available in the hopes that we do not have to use them. Uh, the governor was very clear on when we would have those beds available, which would be prior, prior to when they would be needed, and we've all been looking toward that date as being our, uh, our peak time period. Uh, those initial beds would be readily available uh, in that, within that timeline and, um, and, and can surge greater if we needed that. I don't know if we're at a point where we could say we're 150 beds away from needing to go into that stockpile yet. I, I, I don't think we're at a point where we could say we're 150 beds away. Uh, in, in fact, I'm, we're not at a point where we could say we're going to be 500 beds away because remember, the, these beds, um, again, we're at 150 percent of what expected need was on April the 1 when uh, the total number of cases were significantly higher than they're projected to be today, at least by this one particular model. But more importantly, um, remember that these beds will only be utilized after our initial surge plan, which is to take those patients that are in some of the, perhaps in the larger facilities, once they reach a point at which they are recovering, we're going to utilize the healthcare system in our state first. And so in other words, if, if for instance, um, and of course I'm not a medical doctor, but, um, but we've spent a lot of time working on this over the last several weeks. But in, in normal times, if someone, if someone has a major trauma case and they go to one of our smaller, uh, more rural hospitals that perhaps don't have a specialist, well, we're going to we utilize our trauma care system, perhaps, to make sure that we transfer that patient into a facility that has whatever they may need. So, if you need a, uh, if a patient were to need heart surgery, for instance, that patient will be transferred to a facility that has the ability to treat that patient for whatever the medical needs they have. Well, this is exactly the same model. It's just in reverse. Right now, if you're uh, if the individual is at a facility uh, that is not able to treat the absolute worst COVID-19 patient, and as I appreciate it, uh, at, at their worst, the, the patients require a significant amount of help. That patient may be transferred to a facility that is larger, that has more resources, that has more technology, that has more specialists. 
But at some point, if that patient over a period of three days or five days or seven days, however long it takes, once they get through the worst of it and they're in the recovery phase, it may be that we then can push that patient back out to that hospital uh, that A, is probably closer to where they live, uh, closer to where their, their family is. Um, and so that's going to be the first mode of surge is utilizing the system that we already have in place. If you'll recall, we had um, Dr. Hayes and Dr. Brunson here one day late last week, and it's their group of, of medical professionals working with the Department of Health, uh, with Dr. Byers and Dr. Dobbs and Jim Craig, as well as with the hospitals. Uh, we had hospital administration officials in that group. They are the ones that are working on what is in this, the way we, it's basically the hub and spoke model. Uh, so we're gonna send them out to the hospitals initially. And the reason we're doing that is, is really for a lot of reasons. Number one, uh, we already have healthcare workers that are used to going into those hospitals, and so we don't have to staff up a new facility immediately. In addition to that, a lot of the, the facilities uh, in our more rural communities, their total caseload today is significantly lower than it was three months ago. Why? Because we've asked for elective surgeries to be shut down, for instance, so as to save PPE, things such as that. And so, again, think in terms of hub and spoke where if a patient came to this hospital, they got to a point where uh, they didn't need ICU beds, they didn't need a ventilator, but they also didn't need to go home, then we could transfer them back out. And that's the model that they're working on. Mississippi is, is well known for our trauma care system. Uh, Mississippi had one of the first and one of the best trauma care units uh, in all of the country. And the model that we're utilizing uh, in COVID-19 initially is to use just that where we have the hub and spoke. Now, if we get to a point where all the beds are full in those hub hospitals, all the beds are full in those spoke hospitals, that's when we have carryover uh, into the transitional beds that we're putting at Camp Shelby and ultimately up in northeast Mississippi. And Dr. Byers, if you want to add to that, please feel free to do so. Uh, no, I think you're right on target, uh, Governor. And, you know, this is, this is a way for us to make sure that we continue to have availability of beds. And, and I think that, you know, we can't uh, uh, overemphasize the, um, the measures that were taken to, to at least delay non um, uh, uh, elective surgeries or those non urgent or emergency um, admissions. Yes, do you have any more information on uh, the testing done at the DOC? There was a big one inmate with test results that we're still being waited on. I have not gotten an update on that today, but I'll, if, as soon as I get one, I'll let you know. Can I ask a quick question on the staff that tested positive? You said that they were not at any specific facility. Does this mean they were at satellite facility associated with the DOC? As I understand it, and I will confirm this, but as I understand it, they were at one of the many offices that the Department of Corrections has, not at a facility itself. But I'll confirm that for you. Gerald. Director, have you had any of your employees test positive for COVID-19? We have not. The new, the new website, that allows for that network to be built out for future disasters as well, right? It's, it's not COVID-19 specific. This is something that perhaps had already been in the works maybe before this. Absolutely. That's a good question. We actually um, started this initiative prior to COVID. Uh, we did not uh, bring it fully on board until just prior to. So the timing was good. We would have rather had it up and running prior to this. We'd have had a, you know, a larger database to go to. But fortunately, during this response, we had so much of an overwhelming um, you know, desire to want to help, we were able to collect a lot of these. Um, so we, we've collected a lot, but uh, it was an initiative that, that did predate COVID. Seeing no other questions at this time, uh, as I have done the last two days, I am going to um, I'm going to practice what I preach, and as I said, I want to bring joy to Mississippians, and I want every Mississippian to reach out to their friends and their neighbors. Uh, I've been asked to say happy birthday to a few folks, uh, and I'm going to do that right now, starting with uh, Garrett Myers, who had his 21st birthday yesterday, and Cameron Weaver. Uh, Cameron Weaver is uh, the daughter of commander of Camp McCain, Colonel Richard Weaver. She turned 14 yesterday. Happy birthday, Cameron. Today, April the 7th, we have uh, Annalise Campo turning five, Kayla Krill. Kayla tells me she loves singing and dancing to Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. 
and I, you know, I do too. So Matthew Ham says, loves his daughter and enjoys playing pool. Wyatt Daniels, happy birthday, wants a big Nerf gun party with his friends once we're safe from this virus. Marley Bryant is a student at the University of Mississippi. She goes to Ole Miss, and she wants to work in government one day. And Marley, that's a, I will tell you, that is a noble thing for you want to want to do. And there are literally thousands of state workers uh, and federal workers that are working around the clock right now to keep our fellow Mississippians safe. Noah Hampton, Cole Allison loves football, baseball, and mud riding. Kimberly Hurst and Holly Hurst are twins. They turned 21 years old today. Cole Redwine from Amory has a birthday today. Happy birthday. Reagan Beckham, she loves astrology and excited about the super pink moon being tonight on her birthday, uh, which I understand may be the first full moon of spring. Josiah Goods loves to draw and loves animals. Riley Cooper is from my hometown of Florence, Mississippi. Happy birthday, Riley. Chloe Harrison loves to sing and paint. Happy birthday. Jake Horton turns 12. He loves Star Wars, Legos, and acting in his community's theater group. Audrey Johnson from Greenville. Courtney and Carly Cochran are twins from Waynesboro, Mississippi. Happy birthday. Eli Beltran uh, enjoys going to church, enjoys playing softball, and loves to ride her four-wheeler. Her mom says she is sweet, loving, and that she couldn't be more proud of you. Uh, Eli, your mom loves you and is proud of you, and happy birthday. Austin Page loves to play baseball and loves playing video games. Well, Austin, you need to play more baseball and less video games as soon as this virus is over so you can get out and have a great time. Mamie Bird loves theater. Happy birthday to Drake Wilson. Um, experienced his first birthday in years that won't be spent playing in a baseball tournament. I can't wait till we can get back and the uh, great games uh, will be played again. Sean Pitney Swain and Kendall Coleman are both from Oxford. Their teacher says they are two amazing students who also always give back to their community. Uh, Ahmad and Rashad Sorex. Twins who love to read, bake cookies, play video games, and enjoy playing board games together. Elizabeth Head's turning 13 today. Happy birthday. Avery Claire Underwood loves helping her mom with her little sisters and loves to be outdoors with family. Now's a great time to spend time outside with your immediate family. Um, be sure you're socially distancing. Oliver Crosby plans to be uh, an NFL superstar one day. Oliver, I'm rooting for you. Zachary Schramm from Horn Lake has a birthday. Bradley Morell loves Fortnite in Disney World. Happy birthday to Tinley Helton. Tinley attends St. James School. She loves soccer, basketball, cheerleading, and horseback riding. She misses her family, her friends, and her teachers. She loves all animals, including lizards. Noah Reeves is turning five and has a brother arriving next week. Noah, we're praying for you, and happy birthday, and we're praying for your mom, uh, who's having this new brother coming next week. Reed Paxton Gatlin from Brookhaven has a birthday today. Michael G. in Madison County says he loves grape juice, but he doesn't like snakes. Happy birthday, Michael. Ridge Grace loves mac and cheese and is always cheerful and loving. Happy birthday to Re Wesley Bradley, who loves Mickey, Mickey Mouse. Grant Alexander in Starkville. Happy birthday, Lila Stokes. Lila's turning three today. Branson from Bay St. Louis loves helicopters and airplanes. Jonathan from Coldwater loves making people laugh. Cassidy Shoemaker turns nine today. Happy birthday, Cassidy. Kiara Smith eating crawfish and playing basketball is what she loves to do, uh, and I do too. Alexa Vaughn from Carrier. Courtney Smith in Belmont. Anna Lee Humbers is turning four, turning four today. Happy birthday, Anna Lee. Ainsley Heron loves softball and volleyball. John Davis Causey from Greenville. Piper Boudreau, she will be nine today. Happy birthday. To Amber Branson, who loves dogs. To Courtney Griffin from Cenotopia, she loves crawfish. Paige Bowser from Vicksburg. To Madison Faulkner. Madison's turning 17 today. Happy birthday, Madison. Lily and Corey are redheaded identical twins. Happy birthday. 
Courtney Foxworth in Columbus. Evie Boyd loves her sister and her kitty cat, Sugar. Happy birthday, Evie. Andrea Johnson from Columbus. Kaylee Brown is turning four today. Happy birthday, Kaylee. She had a party, she says, with just her mom, her dad, and her siblings, and they made the best of it. William Evers in Florence, again in my hometown, is having a birthday today. Happy birthday, William. Taylor Jolly is funny and energetic child. She has a charm that you just can't help but love. Happy birthday, Taylor. Aiden Dyer from Purvis. Izzy from Izzy Dupree is celebrating her sweet 16 in quarantine. Garrett Blaine Smith loves to ride his horse. Happy birthday, Chad Bryden and Aaron Sanders, who turned 16 today. Aiden Powell loves singing and the aquarium. Rayleigh Carpenter is the reigning young Miss Queen City. Rayleigh, happy birthday in the Queen City. Jay Mitchell from South Haven has a birthday. Aislinn Wallace is a freshman at the University of Southern Mississippi. Happy birthday, Aislinn. JC from Canton loves her chickens. Happy birthday, JC. Ken Kendall Middleton is a kindergartner at Canton Academy. Happy birthday, Kendall. Ryan Glass has a birthday today, as does Aiden Malley, who loves history, and Lillian Grace Ollie, who loves her baby brother, Jacob. Happy birthday to both of y'all. Darby Still in Fulton. Aiden Williams turns 16. Kirsten Neal enjoys swimming and hanging out with friends. Kirsten, happy birthday, and as soon as we get through this uh, pandemic, you'll get to hang out with your friends again, and I look forward to you enjoying that. Parker Ryan from Wesson and Ben Tun enjoys writing and creating comments. Abigail Jenkins is turning 13. Ruby Marie from Amory has a birthday today. Hannah Reedy is celebrating her sweet 16. Lillian Wright is turning five. Happy birthday, Lillian. ZJ Grimes is a two-year-old. She goes to PT three times a week because she has herbs palsy, and she has been doing great. ZJ, we are praying for you. Alexa, Alexis Kittrell, 16 years old, from Mize, Mississippi. She has been using her time at home to make masks and donate them to those in need. Alexis, that's that Mississippi spirit that we need to keep up. Thank you for what you're doing. Shelby Clark turned 16, and although she cannot get her driver's license, she's keeping a good attitude. I know that's hard. You wait 16 years to get that driver's license, and you have a birthday during the first pandemic in the last 102 years in America, and therefore the DMV locations are closed because we're trying to make sure we don't get large crowds in small, ga small gatherings. So uh, stay patient. You'll get there. Lawson Sanders is obsessed with tractors and says he's going to be a farmer when he grows up. Lawson, we need more farmers in the world. And let me say a special thank you to all the farmers out there in Mississippi and throughout this nation. Um, you are supplying us with the food that we are eating. The supply chain has not broken down. It's something that's been promised by leaders across America, and we're proud of you. Happy first birthday for Rhett from Eudora. He was born with blood clots on his brain and experiences seizures, but he continues to amaze his parents, Mimi and Pop, who say he is the definition of a fighter. Thank you, Rhett. You're an inspiration to all of us. I know there's a lot of Mississippians out there that are fighting. We can follow Rhett's lead. Brooke from Lexington loves cartoons. I'm sorry, Brock Losh from Lexington likes cartoons. Stephen Rogers loves baseball, hunting, and fishing. Ainsley Heron from Batesville has a birthday today. Molly loves her family, loves to dance, and has a heart of gold. Happy birthday, Minnie Bibb from Pearl. Happy birthday, Connor Smith, who plays on his high school baseball team, loves the Saints, the Braves, and the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Lyric Bonner from Madison loves helping others. Alexa Salmon. Alexa Salmon has a birthday today. Happy birthday, Alexa. To Malik Wyndham, left-handed, loves to draw, and loves to listen to music. Happy birthday, Malik. Brad Whittington is a hard-working first responder. Brad, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you to, for your service to our state. Our first responders are on the front line, and they're stepping up every single day. To Cody Stogner from Oxford. Cody is turning 11 today. Happy birthday, Cody. Christopher Hubbard is learning to play the drums and how to shoot a bow and arrow. 
His dad's birthday is on April the 8th, so happy birthday to both of you. Nathan James Carter is turning one today. Happy birthday to Carter Hollingshead and Lindsay Miller. Lindsay likes to spend her time learning to twirl fire batons. Carter loves martial arts. Addison Laird is a junior at the Mississippi School of Art, majoring in filmmaking. Good luck, Addison, and happy birthday. Hawkins Gable from Brookhaven, Jaden Brown from Columbus, Anna Claire Loris from Moss Point. Happy birthday to Hudson and Dawson Parker, twin to twin transfusion syndrome survivors. Congratulations, happy birthday, and we're praying for you. To Antoine Washington, loves monster trucks. To Miley Massey from Oxford and Kirsten Ham, happy 14th birthday, Kirsten. To Elizabeth Schiller from Sochet, from Brady Wooten, who's celebrating his first double digit birthday today, 10 years old. Brady loves to fish, nerf guns, and playing at the creek. His favorite color is blue. Happy third birthday to Lucas Jones, who loves farm tractors. Happy 10th birthday to Carson Sanders, who loves his poppy's Peterbilt truck. I should say thank you to all the truckers out there, because while our farmers are supplying the food, our truckers are delivering it and making sure our supply chain continues without interruption. To Mr. Lee Stingson. Lee, happy birthday. Congratulations on number 87. Stay safe, stay home and be careful. Britt Baker is turning 15 today. Hannah Aldred will be five, and Hannah loves unicorns. Maya O'Connor from Goche has a birthday today. John Pittner Swain is a great student leader, athlete, and worshiper of Jesus Christ. John, happy birthday. Jordan Dell from Quitman. Kaylee Blaylock plans to have a sweet 16 in quarantine party with her friends via social media. Kaylee, that's the spirit. That's exactly what we need to be doing. Proud of you. From Purvis, Olivia Steele, happy birthday. Brand Boyd, he wants to be the first person in line to get that driver's license as soon as the DMV opens back up. Well, there was someone that I mentioned earlier that might get to be in line before you are. Uh, Y'all have to race to it, but we're going to get those back open just as soon as it's safe for all Mississippians. Carla wants to be an air traffic controller. Happy birthday to Cameron Weaver, to Logan Helms, to Daniel Clam, to Lakin Favre. Happy 10th birthday. To Katie Darnell from Lewisburg. Happy birthday. To Cassidy Holmes. She is very protective of her younger siblings, and she is turning 10 years old today. Cassidy, I understand that you love to dance, so why don't you perform tonight uh, for uh, your parents. To Hawkins Gable, he wants a football birthday party. I think a lot of us just want football to be back. Certainly by this fall, I'm hopeful that'll be the case. To Liam Hurt from Tupelo, Abigail Mills, to Livy Kate Chisholm, he loves the, uh, Livy Kate loves the outdoors. Cynthia James, Tabitha Sill, happy birthday. Ava Claire Smith, to Lex Hernandez at Madison Middle School, happy birthday, Lex. Happy 15th to Chloe. Happy 14th to Rylan Lacey. Jeremiah Douglas from Canton. Jimmy Pearson in Verona. Jalen Moore. Anna Hayes Davis from Meridian. Elijah Jones. Happy birthday, Anthony White. Cooper Allgood. Happy sweet 16th to Aaron Sanders. Earp Wyatt Porter turns four today, and he loves The Flash and Spider-Man. Luke Allen loves playing outside with his brother Hogan. Jazlyn Ross from Indianola, happy birthday, Jazlyn. To Sarah Jane Hollinghead, she loves her new bunny, Taffy, and her puppy, Bronco. I understand that today, James Donnell, who is a lover of dinosaurs, has a birthday. Happy birthday, Cooper Allgood, Amelia Barron, Wesley Earl, who turns three today, and Canyon Tubby, who turns ten today. Isabella Nickerson, Loves doing pageants and being in the Girl Scouts. Vivian Richardson, happy birthday to Rhett Corley, who turns nine today. And Rhett loves to play the ukulele. So that's a great opportunity on your ninth birthday, Rhett, to gather your family together in your home and play them a concert. Brock Malone loves dinosaurs and Spider-Man. He can't wait to go back to the Natural Science Museum when it reopens, and we can't wait for it to reopen. And finally, happy birthday to twins from Clinton, Mississippi, Braden and Briley Wilkins. 
Happy birthday. Have a great time. Be careful and be safe. To all Mississippians, we're all in this together. And we're all going to get through this together. Thank you and God bless.